Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Science and Technology Q&A for kids and others. And I can see we have all sorts of questions saved up here. Um, uh, let's see, there's one from Mouse123 that asks, how much does a cat's tail affect their ability to land on their feet? Do cats without tails tend to fall over more frequently? Okay, so first observation, and I have to admit, I, I think I might have tried this when I was a kid, when I had a cat, but I haven't had a cat for ever. And, uh, but if you hold a cat upside down and, uh, and then you drop it, the cat will squint, swivel around and land on its feet. And it manages to do that even from a fairly low height. And the question is, how does it do it? And I remember years ago, a uh, mathematics professor I knew was making fun of one of her colleagues because uh, this colleague had a whole elaborate theory of how cats land on their feet. And the theory had to do with the twirling of the tail of the cat. And, and she observed that actually cats without tails like Manx type cats and so on also managed to land on their feet. So any theory of cats twirling in the air based on their tails has to be the wrong story. I mean, it's, it's worth pointing out that tails are pretty important for balance in general. I mean, lots of creatures that, uh, you know, are, are the, you know, the, the tree dwelling creatures that jump from here to there, they make use of their tails um, in, in balancing. Um, uh, we humans clearly do not have tails and um, the, uh, 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 and yet we still manage to balance. And I, I think that's a, uh, I, I suspect we're not, we're not, you have to be a very special human to be able to balance and jump from tree to tree. Um, most humans can't do that. I mean, it's worth commenting that in general, the, the importance of tails for things uh, is, is great. Like an airplane, for example, uh, you might say, well, all that matters to an airplane is its wings. That's what's going to hold the airplane up. But actually, its tail is really important in maintaining its, essentially, its, its balance and maintaining the right forces so that, for example, the airplane, for example, when an airplane uh, goes up, what's happening is that the, the, um, uh, the, the uh, horizontal stabilizer things on the tail, uh, they actually go up. And that pushes the tail of the airplane down, which causes the nose of the airplane to go up, which put, causes the wings to be have a uh, to sort of have a, a larger angle of attack to be to be sort of pointed more upwards, which pushes, which allows the airplane to then go up. So you know, tails are important, but cats somehow don't need them in being able to uh, turn themselves the right way up. I think that if you look at videos of cats uh, sort of in, in motion in the air, that the big thing they're using is uh, various kinds of angular momentum conservation, because once, once you're a falling cat, it's not like you get to kind of push against something. You simply have to use kind of uh, pure effects that have to do with sort of intrinsic effects associated with the, the cat, not something where you get to sort of touch the wall and, and change your orientation. And okay, so, so actually this lets me talk about another thing, which is things like gyroscopes. So normally, I mean, one of the basic facts about mechanics, it's Newton's first law, is that if you just set something in motion in a straight line, you don't act on it with any force, it will just keep going in that straight line at the same speed. That wasn't something super obvious probably in the 1600s when Newton first formulated that principle because at that time, most of the things that you would find kind of lying around uh, you know, on the street type thing were things where there'd be very high friction. And so it wouldn't be the case that the thing, if you set it in motion, you'd actually have to keep pushing it to have it keep going because it would otherwise stop because of friction. But we know that, uh, for example, in when there's no air resistance, you're in the vacuum of space, you're in, and you don't have, there's no gravity acting on you, 
things do just keep going in a straight line. And, and what Newton realized, one of the, one of the non-trivial things he realized was that that idealization of no friction, no forces acting on something, um, that that was a reasonable idealization to think about. And in that idealization, that things would just keep going in a straight line. So that's the conservation of linear momentum. So the momentum of a thing is uh, it's mathematically equal to the mass times the velocity. And the velocity is something which has a direction as well as a magnitude. So it's like you keep going with that mass and that velocity. Now, by the way, that equation for uh, when you think about mass and velocity and so on, things get more complicated when you have something like a rocket, which can change its mass because it's ejecting rocket, uh, it, it's ejecting um, uh, something behind it and so on. And that gets all more complicated. But then what is the case in the end is this idea of momentum conservation. So that's linear momentum going in a straight line. So there's another kind of momentum, which is angular momentum, which is momentum associated with rotation. And so when you have uh, the, there is also a, a conservation of angular momentum. So if you have something spinning around, it will keep spinning until it's acted on, not by an ordinary force, which is pushing it to one side, but a torque, which is a twisting kind of force. And so when you have something that's spinning around, and it has some, uh, the um, it has a certain angular momentum. It will keep spinning around unless there's friction that slows it down, which effectively exerts a torque. If um, uh, if the um, torque is my, uh, if you, to decode the British accent, it's T O R Q U. Um, the uh, the uh, when um, uh, when you have something which is just spinning around. It will keep spinning around. So let's say you have, I don't know, something like a bicycle wheel and it's not on the ground and you just sort of start it off and you keep it spinning around. It will just keep spinning around um, and, until it slows down because of friction. But if it didn't have friction, it would just keep spinning around. And that's a consequence of this idea of conservation of angular momentum. Same thing, by the way, uh, it, it's um, uh, when you have the Earth going around in its orbit. You can think of that as just keeping going because of the conservation of angular momentum. So the, um, uh, and, and you can ask questions about, so what is the, the, the conservation of angular momentum leads to all kinds of effects. So for example, if you, if you take a bicycle wheel and just hold on, spin it around and you have it mounted on an axle, you hold on to the axle, you try and turn the axle around, the axle, it will be difficult to turn the axle because of this idea of conservation of angular momentum. The thing keep, wants to keep on spinning in the same way, but if you turn the axle, then it will be spinning with respect to a different axis, and that's a different angular momentum. From a, a math point of view, um, uh, let's see how to decode this. It's the, 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 the official math version of what is angular momentum, it's uh, R cross P. If P is the, is the, is the ordinary momentum, something going around in a circle, let's say, um, that is a certain, it's a certain vector direction, it's a momentum with a certain direction, and there's also a radius that goes from the center of rotation out to the thing, and then you take a vector cross product of those things, and what that, that gives you another vector that points at 90 degrees to the other two vectors, and that is the angular momentum vector, and that's eventually the thing that is conserved in conservation of angular momentum. So it's, it's like if you take the wheel spinning around, um, the angular momentum is kind of like the, an axle through the wheel. It's, it's, the, it's, it's a thing where if the wheel is spinning clockwise, for example, the angular momentum vector the, will be pointing sort of up along the direction of the axle. If it was spinning the other way down, around, you're pointing down uh, 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 along the axle. But that axle defines that direction of the axle defines the the uh, direction of the angular momentum uh, vector, and and the, um, the the magnitude of that is determined by the rate at which the thing is going around, the mass, the distance out to that mass. So, in any case, the the um, so what consequences does it have? Well, for example, if you have a top, for instance, a top will just keep spinning because of conservation of angular momentum, it will keep spinning until uh, friction causes it to slow down and eventually fall over. 
but if it doesn't, if, if there's, if one doesn't have friction, it kind of seems like a magic thing because it keeps spinning and it keeps being, being sort of on its little, little point that it's spinning on. And it seems to be sort of uh, resisting the force of gravity. Well, it is because the, the, um, uh, the, the sort of the force of gravity will be trying to change the angular momentum direction. And that, that's something that uh, takes, it, it, it's difficult to do that, so to speak. Actually, the motion of tops is a really complicated thing. In the late 1800s, it was kind of the, the sort of top fancy mathematical thing that you could work out using the laws of mechanics. And there are all kinds of lovely terms. There's this thing called the pole hode and the hurple hode, which are uh, aspects that describe kind of the, the precise way in which a, a top will move around. So, so one of the big things that happens with the top is a phenomenon called precession, where normally you have the direction of an momentum vector, kind of the axle of the top is pointing, let's say, up, you spin the top around, it does its thing. Now let's say you act on the top with, for example, gravity. What will happen is as soon as, the, as soon as that axis of rotation is not quite vertical, it will start processing around. So in other words, the axis of rotation will itself rotate around at a certain rate. And that's a general feature of spinning things and the way that, and when forces act on spinning things, their axis of rotation, if, if it does start to, if it, if it isn't sort of precisely aligned, if the axis is not precisely aligned, then forces will cause that axis to process around. And in fact, um, that happens even for the earth. It happens, um, uh, the, the, the earth is spinning around, but the earth, um, and this is, it's again, it's kind of complicated, the geometry, the earth, the axis of the earth is 23 degrees away from the, uh, from the plane defined by the orbit of the earth around the sun. So that's the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the plane of the ecliptic is, that's the term for the plane defined by the sun is at the center and the earth is going around its orbit. It's called the plane of the ecliptic because it relates to eclipses because you get an eclipse when the moon is lined up in front of the earth obstructing the sun, but that all happens in this plane where the Earth's orbit um, goes, where the Earth orbits relative to the sun. So the Earth is, is um, uh, the, um, oh, gosh, what is it called? Um, oh my, uh, the, the angle of the Earth relative to the plane of the ecliptic, which has a name, uh, is it obliquity? I think it might be obliquity, um, is, the, is the term for and different planets have different uh, different angles that their rotation axis is relative to the um, uh, uh, to the plane of the ecliptic to the orb to the plane that they orbit the sun around. I mean, one of one of the features of our solar system is, and it seems to be true of exoplanet solar systems as well, that the planets tend to orbit in the same plane. It's like the sun was formed, the star was formed at the center, the star is actually itself rotating around at a certain rate. And there was kind of a disk of material formed around the star, which eventually uh, aggregated into planets. And so everything is more or less in one plane. Um, for example, Pluto is a little bit out of the plane of the ecliptic. Um, and uh, that kind of suggests different things about its origin and so on. But um, relative to that plane, most planets uh, kind of have their axis of rotation more or less aligned so that they're kind of rolling around like cogs as they go around, uh, around in the orbit. For example, Uranus has its, uh, has its axis of rotation more or less upside down, um, perhaps suggesting it had a collision with some other planet at some point, but different angles. Anyway, the Earth, 23 degrees from the plane of the ecliptic. And the Earth, like a top, uh, shows precession. Uh, its precession period is 20, 23,000 years. 20, 24,000 years, around that order, 22, 23, 24,000 years, I've forgotten exactly how much. Um, and that is the, uh, that leads to a phenomenon called the precession of the equinoxes, um, which is, uh, let's see, that leads to all kinds of different things. It leads to uh, what the North Pole star will be, because the Earth's axis is processing around, that means that which star will be in the kind of northern direction, right now it's Polaris is the, is the star closest to the North Pole, but it wasn't always that way. And uh, 
uh, you know, 12,000 years ago, uh, it was kind of the, in, the Polaris was quite far off. It was probably 40 something degrees away from the, the, the direction of the north of the of, of north in the sky. So uh, in any case, the, this phenomenon of precession is, um, uh, is, is, a, is a general phenomenon associated with um, forces on things that are spinning around. Um, so the question originally was about cats. And I don't know, you know, the cat doesn't get to make a full spin around. That was what this kind of uh, discredited theory of cats twirling their tails as a way to land on their feet had to do with. Um, but the fact is that you still get effects due to angular momentum conservation, even when you are just pivoting, even when you've got your, you know, four sets of four legs and you're sort of pivoting the legs relative to each other, that still gives you similar, makes use of similar kinds of physics. Um, beyond that, I don't really know the, the, um, uh, the detail of, um, uh, I mean, I've seen videos of what cats do, um, exactly understanding how that works is, is pretty complicated. Um, and I don't know whether there are robots that land on their feet the same way that cats do. There certainly should be. But in today's world, that should exist. I don't know if it does. I mean, the, the, the main issue with many of these things is like drones, where they have four propellers, you know, a quadcopter drone that has four propellers. The big issue with is you take a drone and you just push down on one side of the drone, the propeller that's on that side better be start spinning more rapidly to push that side of the drone up. But the drone kind of has to know which side was pushed down and at what rate to increase the speed of the propeller. And for example, it better not over, overshoot and keep the propeller uh, uh, spinning faster because then that side of the drone will go up. You know, you pushed it down and then it's trying to push itself up. But then if it overshoots, it'll push itself way up. And then the other, the other side will go down and bad things will result. There's some instability that will result. That was finally like a decade ago, roughly. Um, it started to be the case that microelectronics was ready to actually be able to put flight controllers inside drones. I don't know if a flight controller for a robot cat has been made, but I think it could be made at this point. Um, and I don't think it matters that the cat is, um, is kind of made of cat tissue, so to speak. I suspect that you could do it with just purely um, like, uh, like, like, like rods that represent the legs of the cat and things like this. I think you should be able to make that work. And you have some number of motors that represent the muscles inside the cat. Um, and I think, with the, I think it should be possible to make something which will land on its feet, a robot, a robot cat that will land on its feet. So um, let's see. The, um, uh, there's another question here from there's a question here from Aaron about could a planet have internal rotation of its molten core while having a stagnant outer surface, perhaps a slowly rotating surface? Yes, absolutely. The core of a uh, the the um, uh, planetary cores. So okay, so our planet, the Earth has a molten core. Um, why is it molten? Two basic effects. One is it still hasn't solidified since it was formed four and a half billion years ago. It's, it's still waiting. There's, it's, it's like it's a pretty good insulator. Rock is a pretty good insulator. And so the heat from inside the Earth, from when the Earth was originally formed, from lots of things aggregating together and being sort of scrunched together by gravity, that produced lots of heat. And that heat hasn't all escaped yet from the interior of the Earth. And that's why the Earth is hot inside. That's about half the reason the Earth is hot inside. The other half of the reason is there are radioactive elements that are, again, left over from, well, left over from, from the formation of the Earth. They were created, uh, some of them uh, mostly created in, in stars that exploded before the Earth was formed, before the Sun was formed. The Sun is not a first generation star. The sun is, makes use of material that was recycled from previous generations of stars that exploded before the sun was formed. And some of those elements, like uranium, for example, um, that get formed in, in those kinds of explosions and related phenomena, um, those things got included inside the Earth, but those elements gradually decay. They gradually, the nuclei of those atoms gradually explode. And when they explode, they produce heat. Um, and uh, the, the, the sort of 
half the uranium, for example, it took, oh, I don't know, a couple of billion years for even half of it to have decayed. So we're only 4.6 billion years out from the beginning. So there's still a bunch of uranium left over from the very beginning because it just, it halves the amount of uranium every, I forget what it is, every a couple of billion years or so. Um, and so it's, it's gradually halving, but it's not reached zero. So about half of the heat of the earth is associated with radioactive elements decaying and half is, is relic heat from when the earth was formed. But the bottom line is the earth is hot inside. And it's a tricky thing because it's hot inside, but it's also higher and higher and higher pressure as you get closer to the center. It's like when you go into the ocean, at the top of the ocean, the, the pressure, you know, if you're just hanging out at the beach, the pressure exerted on your body is just from the air, and it's just the same as ordinary atmospheric pressure. If you dive down in the ocean, then the pressure that's exerted on your body is not just the pressure of the air, it's also the pressure of water that's pushing on every side of you. And as you go deeper in the water, the amount of pressure increases because effectively the weight of water above you is pressing down on you. And the way it works with a liquid, it presses down on all sides of you, not just on the top of you, so to speak. And so as you go down in the ocean, it rapidly gets, I forget, um, well, the atmospheric pressure is 33 feet um, down into an ocean. That's, that's the, com the, the complete pressure associated with all the air that's above you in the atmosphere is the equivalent of, um, uh, am I right here? Um, yeah, 760 millimeters of mercury. I think it's 33 feet of water. Um, the, uh, that corresponds to the pressure, that would double the pressure on you. So if you're diving, then you get sort of double of atmospheric pressure when you go that deep. The, the deepest oceans are like seven miles deep. Um, they're like the Marianas Trench off, off uh, Japan is, is the deepest point and it's that, that deep. Um, and the pressure is incredibly much higher there. We could try and work out what it is, but we just have to divide um, the pressure just, um, uh, yeah, the pressure just increases. Well, it's not quite linear with depth because the density of seawater changes with depth because the, the seawater itself is being somewhat compressed. Um, but, uh, and also the salt uh, content of the seawater changes. There's a thing called the standard ocean. You can find Wolf and Alpha will compute these things and tell you the, um, the pressure at any depth in an ocean of any salinity. That's the amount of salt in the water and um, the different, different oceans like the Atlantic, the Pacific and so on, they will have slightly different amounts of salt because it depends on how much rock has been dissolved into the water and on all those kinds of things. But basic bottom line is that as you go down in the ocean, the pressure gets uh, very high. Um, and uh, uh, you know, if, you're, if you're a deep sea fish, for example, living down at the, in the depths of the ocean, the innards of you are exerting a lot of pressure out to stop the water that's outside you crushing you in. And I'm afraid one, one sort of sad fact about, about this is when people first started getting deep sea fish, um, I remember when I was a kid, the books that illustrated, you know, what do deep sea fish look like? They always showed spherical fish. Well, the reason they showed spherical fish is because when you take a fish that was used to living a mile below the surface of water and you pull it up to the surface, the pressure inside the fish is very big. And so the fish will, will, will you know, come out like a balloon because there's a lot of pressure inside it, not, uh, not compensated by pressure coming from the outside. But I think when you go down in a, in a submarine uh, to the, and people have gone down to the very bottom of the ocean in these actually spherical shaped submarines um, and uh, the, the fish are not spherical there. That's, that was a, a sort of a mistake from, uh, from the way that they were observed, so to speak. They're, they're, they have a certain pressure inside them and that pressure is compensated by the pressure of the water outside and the fish are just fish shaped or whatever. So uh, in any case, the, um, uh, let's see, we're talking about pressure. And I was saying that inside the earth, there is also pressure from all the rock that's on top of you. As if you go further closer to the center of the earth, there'll be all this rock on top of you that is exerting pressure. Now, again, it gets more complicated because you have to look at the amount of gravity because eventually when you're at the very center of the earth, the, the gravity that is, that is, is there's gravity 
that is associated with the mass on one side of you and the mass on the other side of you. So actually there's no gravity at the very center of the earth because the gravity is sort of pulling you equally in all directions, which means that the sum of that is no gravity at all. So for example, if you drill the hole through the whole earth and you dropped something through that hole, and it would be, it would speed up for a while as it, as it feels the gravity of the earth, but as it gets to the center of the earth, it would not be speeding up anymore. Um, and actually, as it comes out the other side, it will be slowing down because what will be happening is it would, have, it would have developed speed because it was accelerating towards the center. At the center, it would not be changing its speed anymore. And as it comes out the other side, it would eventually be pulled back up, by, so to speak, by the gravity of the earth sort of pulling it up. If you dropped it down at the top, it would be pulled down by gravity at the top. But as it goes through to the other side of the earth, it would now be pulled up by gravity and so it would eventually come to would eventually halt stop at the other side of the earth and it would oscillate back and forth through this big hole that you draw in the earth but in any case when you when you put a bunch of these effects together the end result is there's high pressure at the center of the earth on the material that's there and and here's the thing when if you take so one's used to things like i don't know water for example you say uh, water, you cool it down below zero degrees centigrade, it will make ice. But what makes water make ice? Well, it's that the, the molecules of the water are kind of crushed together, that they're, they're arranged together so that they're in this regular array, which is ice. But one way you can get that is by making the molecules sort of bounce around less with, by having a lower temperature. The other way you can get that is by just squashing the water a lot until it eventually the molecules are just forced. They can't jump around like they do in liquid. They kind of have to be arranged like they are in ice. And, and one of the tricky things about ice is there are many different forms of ice. I think there are like at least 40 different forms of ice that are known in which the water molecules are arranged in different ways. Ordinary ice that we see and that's in typical snowflakes, the molecules are arranged in this particular hexagonal pattern. But there are different forms of ice that you see in glaciers that are under high pressure and things like that. And I think there are like 40 different forms that are known so far, but the atom, where the molecules rearrange themselves. But in any case, the, the, the point is that when you put high pressure on something, when you make something very cold, the molecules slow down, the molecules will tend to just get locked together to make a solid. But you can also get a solid by just pushing with very high pressure. And that's what happens. So when you have something, even if it's very hot, if you push it hard enough, eventually it will become solid. And so that's what happens in the, in the earth. Um, again, there's even more complexity because the different materials uh, that are in the earth have gradually sort of separated out. So the, the earth has a nickel iron core. Um, at the very center of the earth is a solid thing. Then there's liquid that's kind of liquid rock. Um, that's most of the mantle of the earth, the liquid part of the earth. So the liquid part of the earth has currents in it, just like, and, and there's slow motion of, of, uh, of that liquid rock. When I say liquid, if you think about you know, pouring a piece of the, the innards of the earth, I don't think it pours very well. I think it's very, very syrupy. I think it's very, very viscous, but it nevertheless sort of flows at a certain rate. Um, you, you see, well, um, yeah, when you see lava coming out of volcanoes, it's kind of the stuff, more or less the stuff that's inside the earth. And, and that flows at, at certain rates. And it, it's, um, again, a different, different story. But um, you asked about um, things, motion inside the earth. Well, yes, there is motion inside the mantle of the earth. There are essentially currents, just like there are ocean currents, just like there are wind, uh, just like there are trade winds and things, and the motion in the atmosphere. There's motion in the ocean. There's motion in the, in the mantle of the earth. What is the result of the motion in the mantle of the earth? People think that that's very related to the magnetic field of the Earth. The Earth uh, acts a bit like a bar magnet. That's why we can make a magnetic compass and have a needle point towards the north or the south. Um, the question is what produces that, uh, that magnetic field? And it's thought to be associated with essentially currents in the center of the Earth due to, these, due to the motion of things in the Earth um, that are producing that. And I think the, um, so the question is, could one have a planet where the innards, in, in a sense that's happening on the Earth, there is a current inside the Earth, there's motion inside the Earth, 
different from the motion of the whole earth outside. Now, could one have something where there is a, a sort of a, a core that's spinning around once a day inside a planet? Um, I think that's somewhat unlikely, but not impossible. The reason I think it's somewhat unlikely is the viscosity, the kind of friction associated with liquid motion that happens inside liquid rock is probably too high to allow something like that to occur. Um, so it would tend to be a, a slower motion of the thing inside. But maybe the planet, maybe the whole planet might be spinning slowly. I mean, the, the Earth has been, the, the Earth is spinning now because it was always spinning. It's gradually slowing down, but um, it was uh, it was spinning, the Earth 24-hour uh, 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 time, uh, uh, you know, rotation time of the Earth is not quite 24 hours, but... Um, uh, it depends on how you measure it, whether it's relative to the fixed stars or relative to its place in its orbit and so on. Uh, difficult geometry again. But, but the, the Earth has been gradually slowing down in its rotation, primarily because of the effect of the moon. Um, and I'm not sure, let's see, I think uh, when there were dinosaurs around the day, I'm not sure how much shorter it was. I, I don't think it was half as half as long as it is today, but it was definitely shorter than it is today. And a shorter day means the Earth is spinning around more often, so it, it's uh, it's sort of seeing the sun and not seeing the sun more frequently. So that's um, let's say um, uh, a small comment about that. Let's see. Um, There's a comment from memes here. What's the deal with the Tzanebakov effect? The observation a cosmonaut had when spinning a bolt flipped it, when a spinning bolt flipped in space. I do not have any idea. I don't know. Um, the uh, um, kind of the story of 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 kind of effects that happen in weightlessness. You know what? What in if you're in orbit around the Earth? you're basically continually, everything, you're continually falling towards the earth. And, but you don't hit the earth because you, you miss the earth. And so you just keep orbiting around the earth. Um, but in that situation, everything around you is sort of falling at the same rate. And so you are effectively weightless. You, are, you have essentially zero gravity because the things, the, the, the gravity of the earth has sort of the same effect on everything uh, that the you, you're just falling. You're, you're falling in um, uh, uh, relative to the Earth, and everything is falling with you. And so the effect of gravity is it, there's no there's no pull towards the Earth. You don't perceive a pull towards the Earth. Now, in fact, every object, because the law of gravity is kind of universal. Every object that has mass produces a gravitational attraction. So for example, if you have like the International Space Station um, will have uh, um, a certain amount of gravity, it has mass and it will exert a certain gravitational effect on things around it. I don't know if that gravitational effect is big enough um, that it is readily observed. But that's, that's one of the, the things that one can expect. Um, there are lots of strange things that happen in, in microgravity and in, in, in essentially zero, uh, zero gravity. Like, for example, if you have some water, you know, we're used to the fact that you, you, know, you take some water, you pour it out of a glass, you, you, know, you, you pour it and it will land in a big puddle. But without gravity, that doesn't happen. So instead, what happens is water just forms into big blobs and water, the, the surface of the blob has surface tension. So the water, the water molecules uh, prefer to be, get pulled by other water molecules. And so there's always a force that's trying to pull the water molecules together. And so if you take a blob of water, the, the shape that you'll get, because all the water molecules are tugging on each other, the shape you'll eventually get is the one that has the minimum area, which is a sphere. Um, and so that, um, so, Generally, what will happen is you put water in, in zero gravity and you just keep pouring water and it'll, it'll make this, so long as, so long as it's, it has no momentum, it'll just make a blob and you can just take blobs of water and you can combine them together and so on. 
if you actually do that, I'm told, um, you know, you can you can like just blow on a big blob of water and you'll see all kinds of ripples and then you'll see the thing you can start, for example, you can start the thing rotating by blowing on one side. The water will deform a whole bunch because it's not a solid object, it's just a liquid. And it's only, the only thing that makes it stay a sphere is the surface tension effect, which is comparatively small. So if you sort of, uh, if you like a balloon, for example, uh, you know, will tend to stay spherical. You can obviously push on one side of it, but if you have a blob of water and you push on one side of it, you really will be able to deform it greatly. I think one of the things people are afraid of in space stations and so on is if you take a big blob of water and you like, you know, you hit it hard, it will shatter and you have a lot of little drops. And the problem is that they don't just fall to the ground and, uh, you know, fall in a big puddle. They get lodged in all kinds of places. And so I, I gather, for example, the old MERS space station was just full of random blobs of water all over the place that were just hanging out there because there'd been water that had been leaked out of something or they spilled something and it was just a piece of water there. And it was, it's not trivial to go and essentially vacuum up all the, all the pieces of water. So that's, that's sort of a phenomenon that happens in zero gravity. And there are lots of questions, like for example, when you have a splash, if you throw a, a sphere of water at a, at a flat thing, at a, a plate or something, and you see it shatter, what will the shattering look like? I think it comes back in kind of a cone. And then as the cone comes back, sort of a, a, the, 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 um, the thing hits and then the, the water kind of bounces back. And as it bounces back, the, the rim of the cone will eventually break up into little drops, um, which is kind of what you see if you take high-speed flash photography of kind of a, a drop of, uh, of water or milk or something uh, falling into um, falling into a, a, a falling onto a plate or, or something like this, or or falling into other liquid. But you see, it's very very strange. The pictures that you see, it takes only a thousandth of a second. But but um, you know, you drop something in, in in ordinary gravity on on Earth. You drop a drop into a uh, into into you know a glass of water or something. Um, and what you'll see is the drop goes in, and then. Actually a drop comes out, it bounces back. You get this sort of thing with even with a kind of a stalk on it that, that comes out and you get the sphere that sort of looks like a bounced version, like your drop just bounced back out of the water. But then there's also around the edge, there's this thing, this so-called corona that forms that's kind of a crown shape where, where it's kind of like that, that, um, uh, that thing I was describing. It's kind of like a cylindrical or, or conical piece that comes out, it comes back up. And then there's an instability that's, that causes the water. When, when you get the water is thin around this rim of this kind of cone or, or cylinder, around that rim, the water tends to sort of, because of surface tension, the water, the, there's sort of an attraction between different pieces of water, and that causes it to form into different, uh, eventually form separate drops. And so that's why it's called a corona, because it kind of ends up having these things where there are a bunch of little drops formed that look like kind of the, the points of a crown, so to speak. And that's kind of the, the basic structure of splashes. That, that, that structure was discovered back in late 1800s, early 1900s, when people first started using flash photography and where you could kind of have a, you kind of see what was happening right there at the moment of, um, uh, of when the uh, when the when the drop hit the water, and and nowadays you can you can kind of trigger if you use uh, well you can just take a video you can just look at the individual frames of the video but if you're taking a a still photograph you can just listen for the sound when the when the drop hits and use that to trigger your your flash and your camera and so on. Um, Let's see. Ah, there's a, a comment here about this effect about the bolt flipping around. Um, okay, yeah, th this is, it's, it's super confusing what happens, and I think it relates to the cats landing on their feet as well. If you have a thing that's spinning around and it's a weird shape, you know, if it's a sphere that's spinning around, great, it just spins around. If it's a bolt, that has some funny shape. It can be spinning in one direction and spinning in another direction. And the relative effect of the spinnings in the different directions has, is, has a complicated interaction. And that, uh, and so 
you can end up with these with these sort of transfer. Okay, so the the official version of this is a thing called the uh, moment of inertia, or more officially, the inertia tensor. And um, let's see, can I explain this? Uh, well, essentially, what happens is I talked about how angular momentum is just you know when you spin a wheel around. There's an angular momentum vector, the direction is just one direction. It's kind of oriented along the axle of the wheel. But let's say that the thing you have isn't like a wheel. It's a much more complicated shape. Then the whole idea of angular momentum and what's pulling and how and what the effect of, of the motion is, is more complicated. And it's described by this thing called an inertia tensor um, that is a slightly elaborate mathematical object but the basic point is that the equations of motion for, the, for an object, uh, there are definite equations that describe how the object will move. And those equations are affected by all the different pieces of this inertia tensor. So if, if, if you just have something which is just like a sphere, it has a very simple inertia tensor, but you have something that's a weird shape, as it kind of rotates one way, but that's not really its, it, what's its real axis of rotation? You have this bolt, well, if the bolt is, if the axis of rotation is right along the uh, the kind of the shaft of the bolt, that's one thing. But let's say the axis of rotation is not aligned with the shaft of the bolt, then you get effects, kind of complicated effects from from sort of the the different pieces of the bolt that are different distances away from the from the axis of rotation, and that whole thing produces a fairly complicated equation of motion that will cause these these things to kind of like twist and. Um, you know, they'll, they'll seem to be moving around in complicated ways. That happened actually on the MERS space station. Uh, uh, my friend Mike Fole, who was an astronaut on the MERS space station, was there when the thing started spinning as a result of some explosion that happened on it. And it had some complicated motion because it had multiple different pieces to its inertia tensor. Um, and uh, gosh, I don't remember exactly what happened, but it, it had... Um, it wasn't just spinning flat around one axis. It was spinning around multiple axes and doing have a rather complicated motion, and if it, it, and which made it difficult to figure out. You know, do you fire the rockets just that way, or do you fire it just that way to stop the motion from occurring? Um, and that this is something people who do you know gymnastics and things like this are are well aware of all these sort of tricks of changing your moment of inertia, changing the, your inertia tensor, which as a human or as a cat for that matter, you can change that inertia tensor by putting your arms out, putting your arms in. If you're a cat, sticking your legs, your tail, whatever out. I mean, a, a classic effect along those lines is that, um, uh, okay, so I talked about conservation of angular momentum. So the angular momentum is essentially the, the um, uh, it's how fast are you going? How many turns are you doing per second? But it's also uh, how much mass is how far away from the axis of rotation. So the angular momentum depends on the mass, the distance you are away from the axis of rotation and the rate at which you're rotating. So if you're like spinning around on one of those, you know, spinning office chairs or something, and um, you, have, uh, you have your arms out, then a bunch of the angular momentum associated with your spinning will be, okay, your arms are out, there's a, there's a certain radius and there's a rate of rotation and so on. And you're, you're going to a certain rate of rotation, you're going around at a certain speed. Okay, so you go around that speed, then you pull your arms in. Well, then the, the angular momentum has to be conserved, but there's a, the angular momentum has a piece that's the rate of rotation and a piece that's the distance out to the mass of your, of, uh, in your arms. And as you reduce that distance, that has to be compensated for by an increase of the rate of rotation. So you'll tend to go faster as you pull your arms in. And so that, that's a sort of a, a, a standard angular momentum hack um, that, that uh, one, can, one can pull. The, um, uh, um, oh my, the, the um, uh, yeah, Alistair here is commenting on this, um, um, on something to do with the, um, uh, the bolt in space. These geometries get really complicated. It's, um, 
it's uh, I always have a hard time visualizing what happens. And even, you know, as I mentioned with the, with the top, which is basically something with cylindrical symmetry um, or typical, typical top has cylindrical symmetry. That was kind of the triumph of the late 1800s is working out the mechanics of those things. By the time you've got something with all these different shapes and so on, yes, you can use Mathematica, you can do it, you can calculate it. It's not actually too hard. Even Mike Foley even managed to do it while he was on the spinning space station with a, uh, with a copy of, of Mathematica or from language that he had on a computer there. So it can be done even if you're an astronaut on a spinning space station, but um, it's, it's not so, it's such simple math. So let's see. Um, so what kinds of questions here? Um, Oh, there's a question from Parker. Will the Earth eventually cool down enough to stop producing a magnetic field? I think the answer to that is yes. I mean, the moon, for example, does not have a magnetic field. The moon does not have a molten core, doesn't have a magnetic field. Um, and uh, there are, like Jupiter has a very large magnetic field, and it's a probably a much more complicated situation where, um, I mean, Jupiter eventually has a, has a, Jupiter is the kind of like, a, like an owl. It's all feathers and very little body. The, the actual um, uh, the actual solid core of Jupiter is tiny, and it's probably made of, of solid hydrogen, metallic hydrogen. Hydrogen turns into a metal when it when it becomes solid. Um, the uh, and, and most of it is gas, um, and uh, uh, its magnetic field I assume is associated with currents, with motions in, inside that that gas. Um, but I think by the time you are a a, a solid 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 I don't think that the magnetic field will tend to survive. Now, again, having said that, that's again a complicated story because rocks get magnetized. And so magnetic rocks like magnetite or some ore of iron or something like this can get magnetized, permanently magnetized. That the magnetism comes from two basic sources that we can readily perceive. One is when you have an electric current going around in a circle, like in a coil of wire, that electric current uh, will produce a magnetic field in the along the axis of the. If you have a you know a spiral of wire that's wound, it'll produce a magnetic field along that axis. That's one effect. The other thing is that electrons, uh, even inside atoms, can produce a magnetic field that's pretty much associated with the fact that the electrons are going around inside atoms. Even the electrons themselves produce a magnetic field, but that's even a different effect. It's probably in the end, it's all little currents going around inside things, but sometimes it's in a big loop of wire and sometimes it's the electrons moving inside atoms. And so when iron, for example, produces a magnetic field, it's associated with the electrons moving around in, in atoms there. And so the, 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 the kind of the, the magnetic field that's produced by big motion, big convection cells or other kinds of motions, uh, currents basically in the, in the earth, currents both in the sense of electric currents and currents in the sense of ocean currents, you know, things moving around in the earth, that's kind of the large scale way of producing a magnetic field. But it's also possible for rocks to get magnetized and um, the, 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 their atoms are lined up in such a way the electrons, the, the, the orientation of their atoms is such that they uh, will produce a, a net magnetic field. I don't think any of the known astrophysical, astronomical objects are magnetized that way, um, but it's certainly something one could imagine. I mean, in in um, you know, one could imagine a um, uh, you know a magnetic um, a meteorite. Meteorites tend to be quite metallic. I have a little slab of meteorite somewhere behind me, and uh, you can you can put a magnet on it, and it's it's really it's really magnetic. It's um, it's uh, uh, you know back in the day before people knew how to uh, take the iron that was uh, sort of uh, sort of in rock in iron ore and they wanted to make a, a sword or something out of you know perfect uh, you know uh, some perfect metallic uh, material um, if they would could get that by getting meteorites that had uh, you know metallic uh, that were metallic meteorites and obviously there wasn't very much of that so those were pretty rare swords 
Um, I'm going to have to disappear in a few minutes here, but let's see if we've got um, uh, um, a question here about metabolism, which I could try to address some other time. Um, let's see if there. Um, suggestions about AI cats here. Um, let's see. Uh, Parker is commenting that tails seem to be vestigial for many organisms. You know, vestigial means it was there once because it was useful once, but now it isn't useful, but the organism didn't, didn't sort of let it, uh, uh, didn't stop producing it. I'm always very suspicious about these, it's vestigial claims. Uh, biological evolution is fairly efficient at getting rid of things that uh, don't make sense, so to speak. And I tend to think that most things that are there are used by the organism for something or interact with something else that, um, uh, uh, you know, that the organism does. I mean, I, I know oh, a couple of months ago, I managed to give myself a repetitive motion injury on my finger from, from rolling a mouse too much. And I, I had no idea how many things one does are affected by, you know, the ability to move one finger in a particular way. And somehow these things that are uh, just, you know, it could have evolved differently. You know, if we'd had, uh, you know, a different number of fingers or, or different joints in our fingers, we would be doing things differently. But given the particular path we're on, things do tend to get used. And I'm, I'm, um, I think sometimes the, the, it's not obvious what the use is. I mean, I think we talked in another one of these sessions about the human appendix, um, which sort of seems like, what is it useful for? You know, it's just a place where stuff can get stuck and get infected and you get appendicitis. But of course, in recent times, there's been an increasing realization that all those bacteria that live in our gut um, are, are not just sort of a nuisance. They are important to overall health, um, perhaps not, perhaps far beyond just the way that they are involved with digestion of food and so on. Um, perhaps for many other reasons as well. And so it may be very important kind of to, uh, to kind of garden the, the, micro, the microbes or the bacteria in your gut to kind of have the right kind of, uh, you know, fertilization of bacteria there. And maybe the appendix is useful because it, it, you know, certain kinds of bacteria collect there and, and they multiply and you end up with this kind of population versus that kind of population and so on. I mean, in the end, the microbiome, the kind of the population of bacteria in our gut, it's a very complicated collection of many, many, many different types of bacteria. And we all have different microbiomes and our microbiomes are continually changing depending on what we eat and other kinds of things. And, you know, if we ever take antibiotics, it's, you know, zaps a huge fraction of the, of the bacteria in our, in, our, uh, in our microbiome. And we have to kind of rebuild those over the course of time. Um, and uh, so it's a it's kind of a complicated story, and I would I would tend to suspect that uh, you know it, it's not that you can't do without that little appendix thing, um, in, uh, but it it you know it it's set up it, it ends up being used being sort of recruited for some purpose which we can something which we can describe as a purpose um, that affects the way the microbiome works. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I, I suspect there are, there are many different ways that the microbiome can be built and they don't rely on having, you know, the appendix there to produce the, you know, the fertilizer for the garden or whatever. Um, but, uh, uh, but that's sort of a standard way that it gets done. So to say that it's vestigial isn't quite right, perhaps. Um, and, and, and so similarly with tails, it might be that, you know, a cat, uh, uh, you know, who knows what the, you know, typically what happens in biology is you'll have something like a tail. And then you'll, first of all, the tail will have evolved because cats with tails were better hunters, let's say, than cats without tails, whatever else. But then given that you've got a tail, you might as well use it for communication 
with other cats and, you know, wiggling your tail around and showing you're happy or whatever else. Um, I have to say, I'm, I'm reminded of a company which I, I cannot believe made it. That was a company that was putting uh, motion sensor uh, um, uh, accelerometers on the tails of cats and dogs. And it was kind of a, it had a, a cute name that involved wagging. But um, the, uh, the idea was that it would have this accelerometer that was on a, uh, that was attached to the tail of the cat, let's say, and that you could kind of translate from cat ease by, by monitoring the, the, uh, the motion of the tail. And that would be a, uh, you know, I'm hungry, or don't give me that kind of cat food again or whatever else. Um, and uh, that, that would be sort of decoded from the motion of the tail. And I remember, I think those guys were using our machine learning framework to, um, to try and learn based on sort of the observation of, of acceleration of tails of cats versus the actual activities of cats. Could you decode the tail language of cats? Um, and as I say, I, I'm afraid I don't think that was a successful startup, but um, it's at least an amusing idea to imagine, you know, just like we gesture um, around um, in, uh, you know, with our hands. So if you're a cat, you're gesturing with your tail. And, uh, you know, can you, I mean, I think for human gesturing, um, there's sort of a, a question, um, the, uh, 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 you know, can we decode the sort of language of gestures? Somebody sent me actually, a, a person who's a gesture researcher, uh, sent me something um, a little while ago, having analyzed some videos of me yakking about things and um, uh, wanting to understand things about sort of the language of gestures. And uh, uh, one of the questions that, that he was asking was, given the gesturing that somebody does, can you tell if the person is left or right-handed? And so he wanted to know what it was for me. And I, I kind of, I don't think he predicted correctly because I'm left-handed. Um, but uh, uh, then I got a long essay back about the details of what really it means to be left-handed. You know, about 10% of people write with their left hands, but somebody like me, for example, has some, um, uh, the, um, uh, they, you know, I, I write with my left hand, but for certain kinds of large motor motions, I tend to use my right hand. Um, and uh, so that's a sort of a, a more complicated case than just I'm left-handed versus I'm right-handed. You know, I have to say, I just recently, uh, I've sequenced my genome for the nth time. I don't know, probably fourth or fifth time now, my, my whole genome. And I just got back another round of uh, sort of results based on studies that people have done of genomics. One of those studies said I had a less than 4% chance to be left-handed. Well, I am left-handed. Not only am I left-handed, but one of my four children is also left-handed, suggesting a genetic, um, you know, a genetically... Uh, associated trait of left-handedness there. Not certain, but um, so I, I, I made it into the 4% of left-handedness based on some study that had been done about uh, the genetics of left-handedness. I have to say, and I should probably stop here, but another one of the studies that was in there was a study that was about how much people tend to systematize things. And um, it predicted that I had a less than 3% chance of being a kind of person who likes to systematize things which is uh, uh, amusing because um, uh, I, I've spent my life kind of systematizing things, whether it's computational language or whether it's organizing kind of uh, personal systems to, to keep myself efficient and so on. So I think um, uh, the, um, uh, uh, this, this less than 3% thing saying that I was on the systematizing end of things, they didn't, that didn't work for me in that case. So it's kind of the, the, the bottom line there is just because some study says that genetics says that you should be, you should have a high probability for this or that. Uh, there's more to the story than, than uh, what's revealed by these particular studies of, of uh, genome association and so on. All right, I should wrap up here for today. And um, I think the next few weeks, unfortunately, I will be a little bit spotty in my ability to do these sessions because um, uh, it is our annual summer school, which I will recommend very highly. It's our project-based, uh, we actually have three different programs. Okay, this is my pitch moment here. Uh, we have three different programs. One is our summer school, which is a three-week 
three week, three plus one week uh, thing. It has four tracks, science and technology, uh, physics, a physics project, metamathematics that was added just this year and an education track for, for educators and so on. And kind of the concept of the summer school is everybody does a, uh, uh, a unique uh, kind of um, original project. In fact, I just made the list of suggested projects for this year. Uh, and uh, it's like hundreds, by, I, don't know, I would guess 300 suggestions. Sadly, uh, only uh, there'll be like 70 people or something at the summer school uh, from around the world. And um, that's uh, so not all of those projects will get done. And many of them, uh, it will end up being a project that wasn't even on the list that gets done by a particular person. But anyway, our summer school is for, I would say the center of the distribution is kind of late undergraduates, graduate students, postdocs, things like that. We also have our uh, high school summer camp, which is a two week program that has the same basic objectives of doing an original project as the summer school, but the projects are suitable for high school students uh, rather than for uh, intended for kind of the uh, uh, sophisticated grown ups, so to speak. Uh, we occasionally have had high school students at our summer school actually as well, uh, including some rather notable people uh, who've, who've done that when they've been in the sort of high school level. But our high school summer camp is intended for high school students. Um, we also have a, a middle school summer camp for girls that just, that just finished, was just last week. Um, and uh, that was a new thing we just added uh, uh, last year. Um, that's another, that's not a project oriented thing. That's um, a learning technology uh, kind of thing. But anyway, that, that's, um, so the next few weeks is my, uh, my moment um, when I, I view it as my extreme professoring uh, weeks of the year. Uh, long, long ago, um, I was, uh, uh, oh gosh, how long ago is it now? 36 years ago, I was, uh, a, an actual professor like at university. Um, I've, I've, I've not been doing sort of official professoring ever since. Uh, these live streams are, are, well, one of the things that I do that's kind of uh, um, uh, gets my uh, educational urges fulfilled, so to speak. Um, but another thing, which is a more intense and concentrated one is our summer school, summer camp, et cetera. And that's coming up um, just in the next few weeks. And that usually keeps me rather busy. And uh, we'll have to see what, um, uh, what live streams I'm able to fit in. We might even do some, uh, uh, some, have some fun and do some live streams, which are combinations of, uh, of um, being for you all out in the world and for local actual people in person um, at our summer school. We'll, we'll see how that works out, see whether we can get the, the, uh, the choreography of that to work. But anyway, I should wrap up here uh, for now. And um, I see there are lots of interesting questions that um, can be addressed another time. And until then, uh, 